Hi everyone, this is Vladimir again, and I'm here to talk to you about the general linear model. So as a quick outline, I'm going to first cover multiple regressions, and then how they relate to general linear models. Then within general linear models, I will discuss hypothesis testing. And then from there, I'll go into generalized linear model. And by at the end of this, I hope that you'll be able to use this in your own research. All right, to give you a sense of background uh, to the general linear model, first it's important to remember that you know within the mathematics uh, there's something called algebraic invariance, or basically what stays the same across changing variables. Uh, one of those algebraic invariants is correlation. Basically, in this one, multiplying variables that are correlated with each other by some factors does not change the actual correlation or R. Uh, once you have multiple variables put in though, these type of calculations aren't as easy and it's much harder to find those commonalities across them all. So as a reminder, we're going to be talking about correlation every now and then here. Uh, correlation goes from negative 1 to 1. It lets you know how well one variable can predict another variable. It doesn't tell you anything causal about it, but it does let you know how well it can predict. In most cases, the correlation is only dealing with linear relationships, so something like y equals x squared is going to give you a really bad correlation, even though in those cases there's a clear uh, relationship between the two. Now, uh, the first thing that we should remember is uh, linear regression. So linear regressions take the form of y equals mx plus b. Uh, that is the simplest one. In this case, we're dealing with one set of x and y values, and we're trying to find the best value for m and b that will allow us to fit a line between these uh, sets of points. Uh, when we're given two points of x and y, it's very easy to find out what m and b are going to be. Once we're given three or more, it's harder to actually find an exact fit. Uh, sometimes it's not going to be a perfect line, and so in those cases, uh, we try to find a line that fits as close as possible. Uh, so this is actually called the line of best fit. So basically, that's the factors in M and M, uh, so the values for them, that will give the lowest error or deviation from the actual data. Now next from that is the extension uh, where we have multiple regressions. Instead of y equals mx plus b, uh, we can think of it as y equals b naught plus b sub 1 x. b naught here is just the intercept and then b1 is the coefficient or m for x. And that can be further extended to have more than one variable trying to predict what y is going to be. So we have y is equal to b naught plus b sub 1 x sub 1 blah blah blah. So basically what we have here is uh, a k amount of variables on the right, which are independent variables that are predictors for the response variable y. So this form allows us to ask several types of questions and uh, have answers for them, like what is the best predictor of y uh, given all these variables x? And then how do these independent factors x1 through xk uh, predict a single dependent variables. Uh, so a simple question uh, that would use this type of information is uh, which factors go into determining the value of houses. So basically if you look at the number of rooms, the location, and maybe the type of neighborhood that it's in, those three factors would determine what the overall price or y is going to be. So given this form the x's represent independent factors or predictors for y. Uh, the b's represent the independent contribution of each one of these factors to the y value. And then y is a single dependent variable or uh, response variable. Each x sub y uh, has its own correlation. And that's going to be separate from all the other ones. Now, the correlation of any one of those variables with respect uh, 2y after you take into account all the other variables is going to be called a partial correlation. So let's dive into that just a bit more. So partial, partial correlation. Uh, here's an example. We have there's a negative correlation between height and hair. Specifically shorter people have longer hair. 
That is a really weird statement to uh, uh, say, but it is actually true. If you add in gender into the mix, then it makes sense. Basically, women who are on average shorter than men have on average longer hair than men. And men who are on average taller than women have shorter hair on average from women. So when you factor in gender along with height to determine hair, uh, first of all, the original correlation remains. Height and hair is still the same. But the cor partial correlation, or basically the correlation once you're factoring in gender, is zero. So controlling for gender, there's no correlation between height and hair. Gender explains why the, correlation, the overall correlation is seen. There's also something else in these multiple regressions. We have the residuals. It's very difficult to get a perfect prediction of the response variable y given multiple prediction variables x's also on a bunch of uh, different data points the difference between the actual value and the predicted value of x with the multiplication of, by, uh, of b is the residual so basically better fitting models are going to have smaller residuals and the best fit ones are going to have the minimal residual or the minimum amount of difference between the actual versus the predicted this is typically uh, done by finding the b's that will give you the smallest sum of squares of the residual. So to do that, I kind of gave you uh, a pseudo equation here where best fit is equal to the minimum where the sum of the actual minus to predicted given the x's and b's found are squared and put together. This is called the least square estimation and just a good idea to have a sense of how it works in principle. Okay, so then multiple regression can be also seen as in matrix form, rewritten as y equals xb plus e. Uh, e here refers to the residual, which is just the unexplained difference from x and b when you try to find that minimal value for line of best fit. So y is going to be a column vector where it has all the observations for it uh, of length n. Uh, then X is going to uh, going to be a matrix, and basically each row represents the associated X values for the given Y value at that row, and it's going to have K plus one columns. The reason it has K plus one is because um, one of them has to include the intercept for the B's. So that B naught uh, at the top of this bullet point uh, refers to the intercept, and you can just pretend that x there is actually just equal to 1. So if you look down at the bottom, you have x is equal to this matrix and the first column is all 1's because it refers to that b naught intercept. And of course b is a column vector that has k plus 1 values, it's the coefficients that you're trying to find. So how do we actually solve for that b? First we're gonna forget about e because that's just gonna uh, come in later for testing. Uh, so you have y equals xb. You're trying to figure out what vector b is going to give you the closest fit to y. So if you do some matrix math, which we're not going to go into detail here, uh, that's going to be covered in linear algebra. Basically, if you uh, take the transpose of, of x and multiply on both sides and take the inverse, you end up getting this simple form of b is equal to the x transpose times x, and then the inverse of all of that times the x transpose times y. And then of course you can figure out the residuals once you get the, uh, that b value as y minus xb. You don't have to worry about understanding exactly how this math works, just know that there is a solution to it. Now, for multiple regressions you have this answer b equals what I just said before. It is seen as a simple solution in that you don't have to do too many matrix, multi uh, matrix operations, but there are two caveats. All the factors in X, all those predictors, have to be linearly independent. Basically, they can't be correlated to each other, and that's because the inverse of X uh, transpose times X does not exist when you have dependent uh, variables thrown in. And the solution can only have one, vi one y variable. The general linear model overcomes these two caveats and is the reason that it's preferred for doing these type of regression. So one way that we can extend the multiple regression is to turn it into a multivariate regression model. Here basically we allow for more uh, response variables on top of the extra predictor variables. So basically uh, given 
to go back to the example of a house, um, the price of a house could be determined by the number of rooms and the location. But on top of that, you can also have a prediction of how many people are likely to try to buy the house, given those two things. Doing this allows for multiple dependent variables uh, to be predicted when you extend the y and b into matrices instead of just the vectors. This gives you also residual E for each of the dependent variables. So basically, you can see how off the predictors are for each of the response variables. The general linear model will also allow for linear combinations of those dependents. So you could have something where um, the new response y is equal to some factor of the first one plus another factor of the second one. This allows things for like ANOVA testing, which we'll be covering uh, later in the next lecture. So continuing this extension, uh, the general linear model also solves the issue of dependent x factors. So basically now you don't have to worry about there being correlations between them. In fact, one of the reasons to use general linear model is to test if there are any dependencies like these built in. One of the easiest ones that you will encounter is if you decide to make a coding for both male and female as your uh, predictor variables. In this case, male and female are tightly correlated with each other because in most cases when someone's male they're not going to be defined as female and vice versa. Uh, in order to deal with these uh, correlations the, there is something called the generalized inverse of a matrix. Uh, basically uh, you pad the matrix with zeros on the uh, rows and columns in which you have your correlations. This general form has multiple solutions and techniques for calculating it, so don't really worry about it. Just know that it is a slightly different way than the multiple regressions, and it is actually more complex. So the general linear model, what is it? Basically, it's a linear model that allows you to have multiple response variables and allows you to have multiple dependent uh, variables, both in the predictors and in the responses. It deals with the dependence or the correlation from the predictors really well. And it also frequently deals with categorical or ordinal data sets as well. Uh, basically stuff like male, female, or ordinal information like uh, rating stuff on a scale from 1 to 10. In e either of these cases, multiple regression doesn't really do a good job of doing uh, predictions on these. And usually it's more involved with uh, continuous predictions. Okay, so for the general linear model, it can be used in a variety of comparisons and analyses, including ANOVA, ANCOVA, mixed model ANOVA, balanced ANOVA. Basically, if you go to the link here, you can see how general linear model is applied for these. I will be covering some of these in the next lecture. Sometimes, as I mentioned before, your predictor variables can be categories, um, and the GLM can deal with that in two ways in the sigma restricted model and the overparameterized model. So let's say you're dealing with gender and you want to have one variable that defines whether there's gender, uh, a gender of zero, which means male, and one for me, female. That uh, might be an intuitive solution, but what's better is to use the sigma restricted model, which is basically where you give uh, categories on the opposite sides of zero. So let's say male is equal to one and female is equal to negative one. This is nice because the interpretation from the coefficient that results can tell us whether one variable, it, whether it prefers male or female and you can see the magnitude and the difference across these variables. Uh, this is called the sigma restricted uh, model because the sum of these two things uh, to these two categories adds up to zero. And then usually you can actually do a multiple regression with this model because you don't have to deal with uh, interdependencies within the predictor variables. Then there's the overparameterized model. Uh, in this case, we'll have one male category and one female category. We'll, you'll have uh, one for yes or zero for no if they are male or female. In this case, there's a high chance they'll be highly correlated because when one is female, then they're probably not male and vice versa. So in this case, it forces the solution to use the generalized inverse, but it still works. It's just that you can't use multiple regressions on it and you will need to use GLM. So 
Now the important thing is, once you have a GLM which has some values predicting x for a given uh, response variable, you want to know basically how significant those predictors are for that response variable. And this is easily done using the sum of squares in an f-test and it's also used in multiple regressions. Um, there are other ways of doing these tests like chi-squared, but for now we'll just concentrate on f-test. The above doesn't really uh, apply though when you're dealing with like multiple responses or when you're dealing with a subset of the predictors. So this is the case where you have all of your x values and you want to test whether they significantly predict the one response variable y. Uh, for more information on this, you can actually go into the link below. Okay, so when you want to do a hypothesis test, we're just going to cover the univariate regression test. Basically, this is the case in GLM where you only have one response variable, like the price of a house given multiple factors, and you have multiple predictions. Uh, think of the form y equals xb plus e that we covered already before. Basically what you need is the goodness of fit, which is determined by the sum of squares. And the sum of squares is basically you take each point, do some operation on it, that operation is squared, and then you sum it all together. So given this equation here, uh, you have s the sum of each point subtracted with the mean of all those points, and then that subtraction squared and added together. The next one has the predictive values with the mean subtracted from the actual mean subtracted from it. And the next one is the actual values minus the predictive values squared. Put another way, it's basically the total sum of squared, which is equal to the model sum of squared plus the error sum of squared. And this can be actually found mathematically with matrix operations, but that doesn't really matter for us. All that really matters is that there's a way to calculate the model sum of squared and the error sum of squared. So given a general linear model that has k predictor factors, so for instance uh, the price of a house given two predicting values of the number of rooms and their location, what are the odds that all the regression coefficients for those factors are zero? So uh, assuming that you have a matrix that is full rank, uh, as in all the predictors are independent of each other, what you do is you take the model SS, the sum of squared of the model minus uh, the mean of the actual value, and divide it by k, the number of predictors. That will actually give you the variance of predictive va uh, values. And then you have S squared, or the mean squared error, which is the error, uh, which is, again, the actual minus predicted divided by n minus k minus 1. Here n refers to the number of observations or data points, k refers to the number of factors and this is also referred to as your degrees of uh, error degrees of freedom. So given those two values MSH and MSE if you just take the ratio of these which are basically just the ratios of variance you can get an F statistic. The degrees of freedom for the first one is going to be K, or the number of observations, and the other one is going to be the number of observations minus the number of factors minus one. <coughs> if you're dealing with a situation where you don't have full rank or you know uh, where you have dependencies in the predictors or they're correlated, then R plus one is used for K, where R is a number of non-redundant columns. So basically you just remove all the redundant columns to figure out this value. So in the example where we have K is equal to 2, where we have a male and female columns, you know, the over-parameterized uh, GLM, then R would be 1 because you just remove one of them and just stick with the leftover one. So. Given the F test, you will be uh, you will get a p value given a criterion alpha. So, uh, assuming uh, the first degree of freedom is k, the second degree of freedom is n minus k minus one. As uh, you may recall, alpha is the significance level, basically the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis that they're all zero when the null is true. So basically us thinking that these values are actually significant, even though they're actually not. K is the number of predictors, the number of factors going into this. N is the number of observations that you have. Um, and then the error degrees of freedom, or DF2, basically increases when you have more observations. 
As the number of observations grows, that ratio of the model variance over the error variance needs to be smaller in order to reach significance. And we can see that here in this case. So if we have an alpha value of 0 0.05. To be within alpha 0 0.05, given, let's say, df equals 4. So in this case, you have four predictors for one outcome. If the ratio, it, the ratio has to be much higher at uh, 19 if you only have two observations. But once you get to 120 observations with four predictors, then you only need a ratio of 2.4 of the variance of the predicted over the error. So as we can see, basically the more points you have, the difference in the error and the uh, expected values uh, starts going down. So we just cover a general linear model and how you would do a test on it. So let's move on to generalized linear model. Uh, in a lot of cases, you're going to be dealing with this one as opposed to general linear model when you're not dealing with ANOVAs or whatever. So the general li generalized linear model is a subset of the general linear model. This is basically when certain cases occur. In particular, when the response variable is nominal. So, if you imagine a formula to trying to predict the number of children a family will have, it doesn't make sense to make a prediction of 2.5. It does make a, a, a sense to have a predictions of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Basically, the data is non-continuous. Uh, there's also classification and categorization that you can do with the generalized linear model. On top of that, the GLZ uh, allows you to have predictor variables that are not linear with the response. And in those cases, you need a length function. An example would be age and health status. If you're trying to make some single value of health status, or maybe just a nominal one where you have healthy and not healthy and something and normal, then um, as you age, the effect of the age is going to increase much more on the health status when it's higher than lower. So basically, the difference between a 25-year-old and a 30-year-old in the response variable is not going to be the same as a 50-year-old and 55-year-old. So to put it another way, the generalized linear model can be used to predict responses both for the dependent variables with the discrete distributions and for dependent variables which are uh, non-linearly related to the, predicted, uh, to the predictors. So basically what is the difference between GLM and GLZ? Uh, in GLZ you can have uh, an explicitly stated non-normal or non-continuous uh, response variable or dependent variable and only one uh, but you will only have one dependent or response variable. And then, on top of that, there are going to be link functions that connect the predictor values to the response va uh, values. So given, let's say, the multiple regression form that we're used to, y equals b na plus blah, 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 you can have a link function g that surrounds the prediction area. And then if you take the inverse of that function, so f of mu sub y, then you will actually get back this information. And that f is going to be your link function. So what kind of link functions could you have? So uh, you could have something like the identity link where f of z is equal to z. Basically there's no difference, it's just a linear model. You could have also log link or a power link or binomial link or plenty of other ones. Uh, basically this link function will determine how the factors are relating to the response variable. And on top of that, estimating the B parameters is different from what we saw in the multiple regression case. In this case, we deal with the maximum likelihood estimation. I'm not going to go into detail here. You can read up on that more. But basically, I have a couple of ways of determining these values. Um, and the Fisher scoring one seems to be the one that uh, is uh, good for any version of generalized model. So you don't have to worry about what kind of expectations you have or what kind of uh, values you have in, inside the system. So, as a general review, you have your multiple regressions, which have multiple factors or predictors that combine to give you one response variable. So the case of trying to determine the price of a house when you have the factors of the number of rooms, the location, and maybe the asking price 10 years before or how old the house is. 
then you have a general linear model which um, subsumes the multiple regression. Basically, it's more general case of multiple regression. Uh, and here you can have potentially multiple response variables. So trying to predict, um, uh, so trying to determine what the price of a house is going to be and how many people are going to try to buy the house given some factors. And then you can also have interdependent predictors. Um, so basically, you know, when we have a male and female predictors, those are highly correlated with each other. And then given general linear model, we have a specific case called the generalized linear model or GLZ in which one response variable that can be both categorical or non-normal and the predictors aren't necessarily linear with the response and you can define a link function. So just to go over quickly how to use GLZ, uh, this will be your homework that we're going to go over, but just to give you a head start on it. So first, we have to just remember that GLZ allows all types of data, including nominal variables, so basically just labels like male, female, um, or what, uh, what have you. There's also ordinal va uh, variables. Those only allow you to rank things. You know if one is less than the other, or rather one's the minimum or maximum, but you can't do any type of multiplications with it. It doesn't make sense to say, you know, one variable multiply with the other one with the ordinal. Then you have the interval, interval variable, which basically allows you to quantify and compare the size of differences across values. So given, let's say, temperature in Celsius, 20 to 40 degrees Celsius is twice as much of an increase compared to 30 to 40 degrees. But it doesn't allow you to make uh, some inferences that something like the ratio variable allows. So this is basically an interval variable where it makes sense to have absolute zero. This allows you to make a statement like x is twice the amount of y. So in Kelvin, when you have 100 and 200, 200 is more than 100. That's what we can say with interval variable. But we can also say that it is twice as much as 100. In those cases, those comparisons of ratios actually makes sense. So given all this type of information, you can uh, specify uh, what kind of output variable you have for your GLZ and what kind of predictors they are. So in MATLAB you can use the function called fitGLM. This is, allows you to use the generalized linear model GLZ in MATLAB. It's confusing because it has GLM, I know, and I apologize for that, but that's how they do it. FitLM is only for a linearized model, basically multiple regressions. Um, FitLM is a subset of FitGLM. And uh, for now, I'm just going to go over FitLM, but in the end, it's very similar to FitGLM. It's just that FitGLM covers a broader uh, amount of cases. All right, so FitLM can be used on any table, uh, assuming that the table has a last value as a predictive value, but you can also specify it here. So let's assume that you load up the data, cars mall, and define uh, the weight, horsepower, and acceleration as your three predictor values or variables. Then you can just call FitLM, tell it what the x values is and what the predictive value is, miles per gallon, and then specify, obviously, that you want it to be linear. Uh, L, uh, linear models can also deal with quadratic or any type of other uh, format you want. Um, but first here, we're just going to deal with linear regressions because that's easiest to visualize. So as what we can see here is that the estimated coefficients for x1, x2, and x3 are all negative, though uh, uh, a small value. Here, what that means is that weight, horsepower, and acceleration are negatively correlated with miles per gallon, but their values are actually relatively small. Um, when we look at the number of observations, we have 93. So basically, there were 93 data points, or n equals 93, which means that the error degrees of freedom is going to be 93 minus the three intercepts, uh, the three values or predictors minus one, which ends up being 89. The root mean squared error is just the mean squared error that was discussed before, but uh, just square root of that. And then the R squared refers to that value that I talked about in my last lecture. It goes from 0 to 1, and basically it says how much of the variance in the predictive values is explained by these three values. So here it says 75% of that variance. 
And then the F statistic uh, gives us a value of 90, which is just a ratio of the mean squared or uh, mean squared uh, expected over the mean squared error. And in this case, p value is equal to 7 times 10 to the negative 27, which is uh, which many would say is highly significant. So what that's saying is that the odds that these coefficients for x1, x2, and x3 are actually zero is uh, seven times ten to the negative twenty-seven. Uh, very low chance of that being the case. Uh, we will look over more of these type of problems in the homework. Thank you for listening.